We're going to be talking with a couple of farmers from South Carolina about some of the struggles that they've been having since the floods took place in South Carolina last year. We're going to be talking with Johnny Culbreth, who is actually the board representative for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in South Carolina. And we're also going to be talking with William Wallace, who is also a farmer in South Carolina. Say full disclosure, I used to work for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. It is a regional organization that works primarily with black farmers across the South and helping farmers hold onto their land and also is engaged in cooperative economic development. Johnny Culbreth. So you are a farmer there in South Carolina. Where are you in South Carolina, actually? Williamsburg County, small little town called Neesmith. Neesmith, right. So what kind of a farmer are you? I have a, a vegetable produce farm, organic farm. Uh, we, we do about approximately 11, 12 acres in organic, certified organic vegetables. Excellent. Excellent. Now, how long have you been a farmer, Johnny? Uh, well, I got a certification exemption around 2006, but I moved here in 1996, year after that, we started farming. And we were growing like corn, maybe 20 some acres of corn, and things of that in a private garden. But that wasn't lucrative to us, so we just started growing organic vegetables on our own without the certification. So I would say this year, I need to do that practically on my 18 to 20 years. So now, so you're selling your produce there in South Carolina, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Well, let me just let me just mention to the audience that I know you and William Wallace were at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Farmers Conference on February 4th and 5th, um, just about a, a week ago, right, a week and a half ago. So, And I know while you were there, you were talking with the administrator of the Farm Service Agency, actually, who came down from Washington, D.C. to give the keynote address at the Farmers Conference. Now, the Farm Service Agency is engaged in all kinds of programs to assist farmers, including insurance, actually, for farmers. So... You were talking with the, um, you addressed the Val Dulcini, who was actually the Farm Service Agency Administrator at the Farmers Conference, and it was because you suffered from floods that took place in South Carolina last year. Tell us first, what happened in these floods? Well, it was a disaster, actually. Uh, they call it the thousand-year flood. And, uh, a thousand, a, th- me, a thousand year, Johnny, because they're saying nothing like this had happened in a thousand years is what, is what they're inferring, right? right? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. And, uh, there was a lot of, lot of, lot of damage done. I mean, we, roads were blocked off, bridges were caving in, and a lot of detours we couldn't really, also the fields were flooded. You couldn't even get into the field. And in my situation, I had started planning on that Friday on that Thursday or Friday, and the flood came that weekend, that Friday. So it, it stopped. I Maybe I had about half or what, 5,000, I was going to anticipate a plan, 5,000 cows, 5,000 cabbage, and 1,000 broccoli. And I was halfway. So I couldn't plan anymore because we, we got flooded out. You know, and not, not only me, but it was all over, all over the South, especially down in our area because they call it the low country and all the water runs down in our, our area. But they, uh, I asked, I had applied for NAP, which is a non insured crop disaster program they, they supposedly had. And I applied before the flood. Now, my incident happened that I was planting winter crops. And when the flood came, I went up to see about the insurance, which uh, it was, supposed to be no fee for minorities. And when I applied for this, I, I listed all of my summer vegetables. This is what the lady asked me. What are you planning for the summer? So I listed all the summer vegetables. Now, in September, we started planning for the winter. When I applied for this, what they told me was, you didn't apply for your winter vegetables. You're supposed to put down everything over the year, for the year. But that wasn't what I was asked. I was asked, what, what are you going to plant for this summer? 
So that was supposedly kicked me out when I went back to apply and thought I had insurance. But the thing is, they sent someone out to inspect my field. And they took pictures and everything, and they measured the field. And I was under the assumption that everything was all right for the winter crops. And then after that, they said I wasn't insured. So I called a representative of FSA in Washington, D.C., and they told me that they should have explained that to me, that that is a problem. They don't go over everything. Instead of asking me what I planted yearly, they asked me what I planted for the summer. So that was a, a, a big snafu. And I was told that if I wrote a letter of appeal, that they could make an exception for what I didn't plan. Because, uh, and in the letter I said that it was a miscommunication. And that was told to me by the executive director in our office in King Street. And I did write the letter. And then he said he would take it to the board of directors and then they would uh, and appeal it. And I asked him about closing dates. There was an extension on the closing date, but they didn't inform me of that either. But if I put in a complaint, he did tell me there was no closing date. But they denied my appeal, saying they gave a lot of reasons why did I file late, that uh, I didn't come to, uh, report it within the 72 hours, and we couldn't even get in town in 72 hours. The roads were cut off. And everything happened over the weekend. And the, uh, the USDA offices closed on Saturdays and Sunday with, without a flood. So that is, it's several reasons here that they say it that wasn't uh, actually appropriate. And with this committee, they go by whatever the executive director recommends. So, because most of the people on the committee don't even fall. So if he recommends to deny it, they deny it. If he recommends for them to pass it or okay it, they'll okay it. Now, um, Mr. Wallace can go into a little more detail about the, the structure and the way they function. Now, this didn't only happen to me, but I'm all, I say I'm all one of in our area that did file a complaint. So what is the status of this now? I have to write an appeal before another appeal before February the 25th. So, and what about your actual farming? What, what's the status of that right now? Have you? Well, we still can't farm because the fields are still so. Wow. You still can't, you still you know can't I mean? farm yeah. now. Wow. And, well, we can't even project what's going to happen because it's just about this time of year you have everything planned. Oh, my goodness. And it's been raining consistently at least every week for a day or two since that. And the ground is waterlogged. It, it just, just don't go away. It don't run off. Now, just for some clarity here, so you, you were denied assistance from the Farm Service Agency, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it seems as if there was a glitch in the communications here. A lot of complications, actually, Johnny, it seems to me. And then, in addition... The governor of South Carolina, when she was asking for some assistance from the federal government in the aftermath of these floods, she didn't even include agriculture in the mix. Is that correct? That's correct. Wow. That is correct. And, uh, you know, because I, I called and even asked her, did they have a plan, a disaster plan for agriculture? No. None whatsoever. So we went to FEMA. He was not allowed to fund anything with agriculture. That, that, to me, that doesn't make sense. You know, I went through the, the disaster through the USDA. They don't have a program for that. Wow. And, then, and I also, this is when I was denied from that. And then, then I thought I had insurance, and they say I didn't. So now... So that leaves us out all the way around. Wow. Everywhere you turn right now, it seems. Right. Okay, so tell us about what you said to um, Mr. Dulcini, who is the administrator of the Farm Service Agency, last week when you were at the Federation's um, Farmers Conference in Albany, Georgia. What did you say to him? Did you explain well, this to him? Is that question, correct? Go ahead. Go my ahead. question was, were they, was this right what they had done 
to me, not only me, but that was big. I explained to him exactly what I explained to you just now. And then I asked him, you know, was this the procedure? And he said, he said no, he would look into it. And for me to send him a, a copy of uh, the letters that I wrote and their denial. And uh, we had a, a conference after the, a meeting after the conference, and I had sat down with him on a one-on-one. And he said he would get to the bottom of it and have his people look into it. But I haven't heard anything since then. So, uh, now, Mr. Delcini also said that he was going to visit South Carolina. Didn't he say that as well? He did say that. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So, my other question is, before we talk with William, is are there a lot of other farmers also making these complaints with the Farm Service Agency or with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in South Carolina? There are, uh, there are a lot of other minority farmers that are have complained, but in our situation, some of the people don't go back. You know, they accept it, the one-time denial, and that's it. They don't appeal anymore, and a lot of them say, what's the use? You know, cause they, they were not going to get anything. But I'm one of the few that uh, is speaking up about what we think is unfair. You're not going to give up, right, Johnny? <laughs> No, I'm not. Right, no, exactly, not. exactly. Now, tell me again, how many years have you been farming? Since I'd say between, we started, I started in 1996, 97. Okay. But my wife was, where we farmed at, my wife was raised here. She was raised on a farm. Ah, right, right, right. Okay. And so she's been farming practically, I'd say, all her life. And, and that is my backup because she actually knows more than I do about farming. Have you had many other problems with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, actually? Is this new? Yes, I have. Like this past winter, we had a severe storm, ice storm, and it was more or less the same situation. But a gentleman that you will be speaking with at the time was working temporarily at FSA, and he informed a lot of the black farmers in our area of what the applications they could put in for storm damage. Right, I was one of them. And when I put in for the storm damage, they didn't give me the proper funding. And uh, I, I got a copy of everything that I went through. When I got home, I went over it again, and then I think they insured me about $700, 800 And when I called back to the office, uh, the, the director told me to come in tomorrow morning to get it straight. It's a glitch in the computer, these things happening. But if I hadn't a call or if I hadn't went over, that would have been just seven, seven eight hundred dollars I would have lost. You know, and when I went back, he straightened everything out, he blamed the computer and the system and did an adjustment. What Johnny now, with the I'm year, sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, finish, please. Now other, some of the other problems I've had with USDA with the NRCS, natural resources, terminology. Uh, now, they have it. I'm going to use this for an example. They have a term. They'll put up a buffer, which is like a hedge, especially with organics. Mm-hmm. If the farmer's near, you need a hedge. If the wind blows and they're using chemicals, it, it more or less filters that chemical. And the term is repairing, repairing buffer. If I go in there and say, I need a buffer, I like to apply for a buffer, they say they don't know what I'm talking about. And unless I explicitly say riparian buffer, they won't even make a lot of application. Now, I went up there with several people to help them explain the terminology. And you must use this terminology or they're going to tell you they don't know what you're talking about. And they did not accept the application on a, a check. Now, how many of us, and a lot of people in our area, still not illiterate on success. Not to say they're not smart and not educated to a degree, but they literally they don't understand a lot of these terms or the, uh, the way they say things or don't tell you different things. If you don't know, they won't fill the gap. And that should be part of their job. That's unfortunate. It sounds like there's a lot of education on the part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture that's required here. But tell me, um, Johnny, what kind of relief are you looking for? What do you All need? I want is, is the assistance that they offer 
uh, even though we're small farmers, that they offer to the large farmer. That they, they and the, the thing is that they sent an inspector out here, and he was more or less amazed at the way our farm was and was kept and the way we measured the field. And he he told me, now this is another one that thing that I asked for. I had a lot of sets that we hadn't planned. Half we didn't plan. I asked him, was there anything for preventive farming, for preventive planting? He told me in the office, no. And the guy come out to respect my field, and his name was Wayne Davis. He told me, did you have anything you didn't plan? I said, yeah, I have a trail over there, and I would let me see it. He went over there, took pictures. He said, you can get paid for this also because the weather prevented you from planting. Mm. Well, he told me in the office they didn't have anything for that. And he wrote it in on uh, the forms that he filled out, how much, how many vegetables or sets I had left that were damaged and I couldn't get them in the field. So this is the thing they go through. If this guy come by and let me know that, I'm still be under the impression that it's just something I lost. But they have made allocations for this and don't really agree to write them instructions or the directions or let you know what they are. And I asked for this, and they told me no. They didn't have anything there. So now you are looking primarily at this point for financial relief. Is that correct? What's that again, please? Financial relief. You need you need, right, exactly. you need some money for, for the losses that you've experienced uh, under the circumstances. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah. That's correct. All right. The administrator of the Farm Service Agency, Val Delcini. I can certainly look into the details of that a little bit more, sir. I'm happy to do that. Fred, are you or some one of the key members here writing down some of these issues that I can follow up on when I go to Washington? Rodney, maybe you can do that. That would be great. Happy to look into that, sir. Uh, I'll just tell you, the disaster programs are different now than they might have been when you started farming some years ago. We used to have these ad hoc disaster programs, so whether it was a freeze in my home state of California or a blizzard in the panhandle of Texas that killed 50,000 cattle or flooding in the Carolinas that happens once every thousand years, we had an ad hoc program to provide you with some relief. That went away, and so our programs now are much more risk management oriented, like NAP or like regular RMA products, other kinds of crop insurance, and it doesn't provide that immediate assistance to you to pull yourself up from uh, you know the floor and get back to the business of farming. But I'm happy to look in a more detailed manner into the issues involving your application for NAP coverage there and be back in touch with you. Well, I want to introduce you to Davina, who is my colleague from the Risk Management Agency, and she can provide you some uh, sort of technical explanations for the preventive planning issue that you went through. I would say, if I could borrow your phone for just a moment, Davina, we all carry around one of these nowadays, and I would heartily recommend that for a farmer that suffered from some kind of natural disaster, that you really document the losses that you're coming back into an FSA or RMA office with. So you've got photographic record of the crops that were lost, or you can demonstrate that your field's under a foot of water or something like that. And that will make it easier when you go back to a county committee that may you know, look at your issue and say, well, he didn't have enough of a record to do that. Uh, I would also say on the county committee side, and I mentioned the fact that I think we're doing a better job of finding more diverse county committee members around the nation, still have a long way to go there, but you have appeal rights based on that county committee decision up to the state committee, and frankly, you can continue to appeal it up to my desk. So, you know, you've got some appeal rights there on that initial determination that they sent to you in the form of the letter, but in the meantime, make sure that you connect with Davina while she's here this afternoon, sir, and and learn a little bit more about the preventive planning. And then for everybody, I would just say, make sure you've got a good photographic record of any damages that happen to your operations here in the Southeast or in any other part of the country, because that'll make it easier for me to, than pay you. Hello, Heather. Hi, this is William Wallace. Hi, William. William is also a black farmer in South Carolina and has been struggling in the wake of this flooding that took place in South Carolina last year. So Absolutely. William, you yes, you are a farmer and you are a you're a veteran. Yes, US Marine Corps. Of the US Marine Corps. And I just want everyone to know that the US Department of Agriculture has had a special program actually to um, offer assistance to veterans and uh, to help them go into farming and you have 
you are, and the Federation has been, Federation of Southern Cooperatives has been involved in this program as well. And so you are what we refer to as a beginning farmer, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Um, I grew up around agriculture uh, most of my life, but as far as running a farm myself, yeah, I'm pretty new. I'm a rookie. <laughs> so tell us first about your naval experience. Where were you? What did you do? Where were you? You, tra- uh, you traveled a lot, right, William? Yes, ma'am, I did. Uh, of course, the Marine Corps is an amphibious force, so you're on ship, and um, the boat can go pretty much anywhere. Uh, I was on the West Coast, Camp Pendleton, so that's called a West Pack. So you go into, like, Guam, Hawaii, the Middle East, of course, and pretty much back around uh, Korea and back home. Um, I also traveled to London and Scotland and trained with the British Royal Marines. But I've, I've done, done a lot of traveling uh, on the boat. Uh, also with my first duty station, we were top secret duty. So I, I traveled to Rota, Spain, Greenland, and all throughout Europe uh, quite a bit. All right. And so when you... Retired, I guess you could say retire, right, from the Marines. You wanted sure. to go into agriculture. Is that correct? Yeah. And that's yeah. what you've done. So tell, tell us about what kind of farming you've been doing. Uh, I've been doing conventional produce. I had first started out with some what's called grain crops like soybeans and corn, but due to limited land, I didn't do very well. Also, the high equipment costs. I and mean, that's when I got involved with the Federation and began to look at newer things coming out, produce, uh, fish farming, organics, things of that nature. So that's where I'm at now. Right now, I'm actually transitioning from the conventional produce, uh, trying to get into chemical-free, uh, and a few organics. Excellent. Good for you. So how many acres are you farming on? Uh, right now, 50. 50 acres. Wow, that's good. So, all right, so William, what happened last year about the flooding? Tell well, us what happened. I, the flooding was pretty, man, it was, it was a disaster. I mean, it, it, I knew what would happen uh, once the rivers begin to crest. We're surrounded by rivers here. Uh, like Mr. Colbert said, this is the low country. Um, if we were in Mississippi, you would call it the Delta. Uh, we have the river runoffs heading toward the ocean here. We even have, you know, we have the large rivers, and then we have their runoffs that look almost exactly like the big rivers themselves. So I kind of knew that with that amount of water, what was going to happen. I worked with the USDA the year before, so I knew that the farm bill really wasn't going to cover a lot of the damage. Um, We had FEMA come in. And they, they didn't do the, um, they really didn't back the farmers. Uh, they didn't back businesses. Um, everything was a loan. And we've had some tough years in farming. So people are afraid to get loans. I'm already owe a loan. So if I get a loan, and this is not me personally, but just other people, if I you know, get another loan to pay off that loan, then I'm further in debt. So a lot of people were looking for grants or just some type of help to assist them just to, just to get out of the day, the situation that they were in. And uh, it really didn't come through. There was a $500 grant awarded to farmers. Well, Willie Nelson's group did that. Willie Nelson uh, being far, farm, farm, aid, farm aid. aid, yeah, right. And what did they do again, I'm sorry? what? How did they help you? They, they gave uh, the farm aid organization gave farmers five hundred dollars. Okay, excellent. Uh, in a grant, and that, and that was good. I mean, that lets you know that somebody cares. Uh, we have to really look at farming. I mean, this is feeding the country, feeding the world. So, uh, he, that was that was tremendous. Uh, I, I thought the floodgates of assistance were kind of just open up. Once people, once he did at 500, I just figured that bigger things were coming uh, down the pipe, but it, it did not come. Um, the government basically 
to where you have crop insurance. And that's a, it's, it's a ball game for vegetable farmers. Mr. Cobra just gave you a really good example of how it works. You know, it's all for this free to minorities. And it is free, but the losses have to be really high. And then there's so much you have to do to squeeze in to the guidelines, to the criteria to get the money. A lot of those things are not explained. People go into the county USDA office. Uh, God knows what kind of experience they may have had before. And they greet it with maybe a smile, maybe not. But you get a lot of acronyms. You get a lot of terms that older farmers may not know. I'm 40 years old, and I'm a young guy. A lot of farmers, majority are in their late 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. So there's an education gap. Um, there's a technology gap. Most of them don't have web addresses, not on the Internet or, or not not computer savvy. They're getting eaten alive in the office. And I guess the co said people don't go back after they hear no or they're given a letter that says they were rejected. They just kind of take it as, well, this is how they do business. That has to, to stop. William, um, let, me, let me ask you this question. It sounds to me in talking with both you and Johnny Colbreth that there's a lack of communication and education here on the part of both the U.S. Department of Agriculture as well as the farmers, right? Yes. That, yes. Yeah. So, the, and you know, it seems to me I'm hearing that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Farm Service Agency, is also not well informed about some of this or they're not they're not asking the farmers what they should be asking in terms of crop production and so forth is that correct and that's correct and, and that's i was going to get to that because what's happening is this nap is fairly new and I, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt in the office by saying they have a lot on their plates so now you're adding one more thing to the plate exactly, exactly. not only you, you're adding it and they're not as familiar with it as they should be, or certain customer service reps in there know it a little bit better than others. What if you don't get that person? You see what I mean? Let me explain something else. Regular crop insurance for cotton, for example, or sugar cane, it's handled by salesmen on a commercial level. The crop insurance company, that guy's a salesman. He's going to sit down with you and break it down, explain it, tell you what's going on. Like Mr. Colbert said, this stuff here, this nap for the produce farmer, for the small farmer, is handled in-house. The county director has the final say. He takes it in front of the committee. The committee can be guys that raise sheep or cattle, guys that are seventh or eighth generation cotton farmers. Guys that don't know the produce industry, guys that don't know the specialty crop industry, guys that don't know fish farming, NAP covers all of that. So you're putting somebody's livelihood in business in the hands of a guy that has no idea about the formalities, what may happen or what may not happen. And you're asking him to vote on. That's something people don't know about. The USDA county offices hold elections from the farm pool of farmers, and those guys will represent certain sections of that county. Now, with that being said, it could work out great, but <laughs> or they go on that, right? They go on the recommendations of the supervisor, which we have the county director, and he oftentimes goes on, on their advice. So it's not a fair balance. Let's, let's stop uh, here for just, just, I just want to just jump in here for a moment. I want to talk about NAP, and actually it stands for the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program, NAP. Yeah, I know it was yeah. started in, I believe, the 1990s. It was a way of offering insurance for primarily minority farmers, as you're saying, or for small farmers. So, So what you're saying is that those who are supposed to be assisting the farmers in the FSA, the Farm Service Agency offices, 
are not all that familiar with the program. Is that what you're saying? I mean, and that on top of the fact that farmers as well need to learn about these programs. Everybody, everybody needs some education here. I'm re- repeating myself, I think, but that's what you're saying. Is that right, William? That's it. And so the farmers... And the thing about it, go you ahead. said that it started in the, in the 90s. It really hadn't been advertised or pushed until about the last three or four years. Right. So what you're saying is that the farmers are putting their well-being and their livelihood in the hands of people at the U.S. Department of Agriculture who are not necessarily all that well-informed or providing the farmers with the information that they need to know. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So what do you propose be done about that? I propose that there, I would honestly like to see, because all of that money, whether it's NAP or the regular crop insurance, it's all money that's allocated from the government. That's why there's cutoff dates to getting the insurance. The government needs to know how much money they need to give FSA and USDA. If I can buy insurance or, or pay the losses, pay for the insurance from a crop adjuster or an insurance agent, then I think we should be able to purchase the, the, the NAP insurance should be funneled through an outside agency as well. I mean, this is, this is important. Give me a guy that this is what he does, not a guy that has three other projects on his desk. And it could be ran the same way. The loss in the crop is what pays the down payment. Either way it goes, most of the crop insurance that you get, whether it's cotton or soybeans, once again, or whether it's the map, there's no payment up front. It's just verification that this is what you have and this is what you're doing. When there's a loss, and, and normally, I mean, between animals, weather, things like that, insects, there's going to be a loss. The insurance agents are not worried about getting their money. So I think either there'd be a NAP department, a NAP specialist, then we have to run it another way. It has to be ran through the through the insurance agencies. William, we're going to take just a quick break and we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. All right, again, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and we're talking with farmers from South Carolina, actually black farmers in South Carolina who have been struggling in the aftermath of the floods that took place in South Carolina last year, struggling because they've not been able to get the benefits that they were expecting, actually, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, given the losses that they experienced. Right now, we're talking with William Wallace. William, I do want to ask you a few more questions here. You were also attending the Farmers Conference, the Federation's Farmers Conference, this past week in Albany, Georgia. And on February the 5th, along with Johnny Colbert as well, and a delegation of you all from South Carolina, you asked the Farm Service Agency, um, Val Dolcini, who was the keynote speaker at the Farmers Conference, some questions. What did you ask him? I asked him about the proficiency of NAP. Uh, what could be done to make this a better service? Also asked about planning. What What is the state doing as far as preparing? We had dams in the upstate that were opened, and the floodwaters were released from the Columbia area to trickle down. Uh, we get about 12 inches of water from Columbia uh, periodically throughout the year. But in two days, I believe we got three feet of water from Columbia. Surrounding rivers were flooded. So I asked about the preparation. Uh, everywhere you ride here, there's standing water, high levels of standing water. So what are you doing to, what can be done to help us if flooding happens again? I also asked questions about moving farming into getting back to producing food and not so much textile products. Yes, that's not good. Not so much, <laughs> so much grain for animals, not so much fiber, but actual food. You know, what's being done to 
to reintroduce that. What type of payment programs? There were ridiculous payment programs for guys who grew ethanol corn, but those payment programs are not there for a guy that's growing tomatoes. So I asked about those things, like I said, because I worked in the USDA and I saw the, the disparity. I saw that there's nothing motivating someone to break their back to grow lettuce, but to grow ethanol or to grow cotton, there's, there's a large financial incentive. So we need to we need to work on that. Uh, that's something that needs to be done. How can I get a young man younger than me to do this if I can't show him a profit? He, he, he can make a living. Uh, I won't say that there's, of course, you know, we know our history in this country. There's some racism throughout certain things. But all in all, if we can just get the government behind us, we can, we can make it work, you know. Yes, <laughs> I'm inclined to agree with you, absolutely. And what what did Dulcini say to you? What was his response? What, is, what was your well, impression? He told me about the new farm bill coming out, and I knew that um, our next president will have to draft a new farm bill. He said he wanted to be a part of it. Uh, he would have, That would be something that would have to be put into the farm bill far as a, a program that paid produce farmers off of uh, what's called BASE, which is a, a system of monitoring how hard you've been working, basically, on, on, the, on the, the land that you control. You know, what have you been doing? You know, how have your yields been? Uh, it's not a bailout, but it's a, it's a help out. And like I said, it's been done for years for guys that grow ethanol, corn, soybeans for livestock feed and plastics, things like that. There's been a, a large payment program, depending on the better you do, the better that, that program payment is. Uh, and that's another issue is that most small farmers and definitely minority farmers, and this is what I saw working in the office and then working with the Federation, and talking to farmers, they had no idea that play, that payment plan went on. A lot of landowners that rent their farms had no idea about that payment plan. You know, I had people that say, well, I got 75 acres in rain. If I had known about that program, I would have kept my land and I would have farmed. But that's another thing, Heather, is a lot of USDA officers, you go in and tell them you want to farm, they do a good job of talking you out of it. You know, if you don't marry anyone or you're not rich already, don't do it. And I'm wondering, how are you going to keep your job if you're talking farmers out of farming? You know, that's that's a big, that is a big problem right. also. Need, we need a lot of changes in all this in America, am I right? Yes. Yeah, right. The administrator of the Farm Service Agency, Val Delcini, Good questions, William. The first on the South Carolina disaster. Uh, we're working closely with the leadership in South Carolina, and I've got to get down there myself, actually, to visit with some of those folks, and maybe I can come out and take a look at your operation there at some point in the next month or two. Uh, we're also trying to work with the Congress that will likely, you know, want to appropriate some funds, hopefully, for some relief there. On the issue of whether we can get produce into base, you know, this has been a challenge coming from California to make sure that fruit and vegetable producers have more, uh, you know, more programs available to them in things like the Farm Bill. That will require a statutory change, William, so the 2018 Farm Bill is an opportunity to add base into your production or the production of others there. It's not something that's within our regulatory ability to change at this point. Right. Well, sure enough. Good questions. The first part of your question was, are we going to be hiring more folks like Rodney Brooks here in Georgia to do that outreach to new and beginning farmers and to others that have been underserved or poorly served by our programs? What we're starting out with is five positions. Most of them are east of the Mississippi, although I think one is in the Dakotas. There's a woman that's going to be doing Kentucky and Tennessee. Rodney's down here in Georgia. We've got one in, I think, Virginia, West Virginia. I don't know that Carolina is in this first round. 
what we requested in our budget was the authority to hire about 25 more of these folks around the country, and whether the Congress goes that way remains to be seen. But we think it's an important investment in sending the message out that it's the FSA programs, or RMA, or NRCS, or some of the other programs that USDA offers need to be disseminated to a broader audience. Uh, whether it's folks with internet access, like the younger generation of farmers, or folks that rely more on paper newsletters or other forms of communication. That's our challenge, too, from a budgetary perspective, and I won't bore the group with uh, you know, the recitation of my budget woes, but suffice it to say, I don't have nearly the staff I had just several years ago, and so I'm trying to figure out how to continue to serve my mission of serving you with 20% fewer staff than I had five fiscal years ago. So that's my challenge, William. But in the meantime, well, we're hopeful that you know folks like Rodney are going to be successful. I'm certain he will be in this part of Georgia, and that the, then be able to replicate that uh, model around the country. And I'll give you my card before I leave today, and maybe we can connect on the South Carolina issue. <laughs>